So thank you, Daniel, and for the very kind introduction. And thank you, Stefan, for inviting me over here to Stockholm. It's my pleasure to be here. So today, the title of the talk will be From, functional, from MEG Signals to Functional Connectivity. So the talk will be divided into three parts. So first, I will be speaking about functional connectivity in general and bring up some, uh, some studies that uh, to me seem to be very important in the field of MEG in terms of functional connectivity. And then I will move on to the second part of the talk, dealing with uh, functional connectivity with the periphery. So that's the corticokinematic coherence uh, Daniel has been uh, just told, just Daniel just told you about. And then uh, finally, if I have time, then I will uh, speak about uh, sort of corticokinematic coherence, but in the context of movement observation. So first of all, uh, why, should, why am I now speaking about functional connectivity? Uh, it's because we think that the brain is organized according to mainly two principles, which are functional segregation and functional integration. Uh, the functional integration means, uh, functional segregation means that different brain areas specialized for special aspects of uh, our behavior or motor, of our motor control are segregated in the cortex or in the brain. And uh, those brain areas need to communicate with each other to bring about the function and they need some functional connectivity or effective connectivity uh, between each other. So brain studies have been mainly focusing on uh, functional segregation, where the brain functions are located. Uh, and only in the past, let's say 10 years, uh, people have been interested more into the functional integration, try to see how the, brains, uh, the brain areas are actually communicating together. So before uh, tackling the issue, let me just uh, recall the basic principles of MEG. I'm sure that you've been through that over and over again those past few days, but it cannot hurt. So when a cell activates, it means that it receives some excitatory uh, postsynaptic uh, potentials at the level of the synapses. And this will induce some currents in uh, the dendrites of these neurons. And if the neurons are organized well enough in the cortex, as it's the case uh, in the cerebral cortex, then, and if many neurons enough are recruited, then this will generate a magnetic field swirling around uh, those neurons that can be picked up by our MEG sensors. So in the case of, uh, of Stockholm, they have now uh, a Neuromag soft, a Neuromag, uh, magnetometer with 300 sen 306 sensors placed all around the head of the subject or participant. And in a typical uh, evoked paradigm, then you people can average out signals and try to uh, identify some maps of uh, evoked magnetic field. And then using their preferred inverse solution, for example, dipole modding, retrieve the source of uh, neuron activity responsible for the special stimuli with average data with respect to, or use more advanced techniques such as distributed source models. We'll, I will mainly speak about this kind of uh, distributed source models because this actually allows to reconstruct first the brain activity and then uh, perform some connectivity between uh, different parts of, this, uh, of the brain. To perform connectivity or to do inverse solution with distributed source model approach, one needs to define a source grid, a grid source space on the brain. So placing some, uh, some sources everywhere on the brain. So here you have a five millimeter grid source space it's not constrained to the cortex. Sometimes people like to constrain it to the surface of the cortex. This is not what's illustrated there. One second. It's not going to happen again. Let's put your cord. Very good. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so once this grid is uh, modeled on the, on the brain, we need to define the spatial relationship between the sources and the sensors so that we can model what's actually called the, the lead field. I hope you have been through that again, linking uh, the current density or the, the activity at the sources to the brain activity, to the, 
the magnetic activity recorded by our sensors. This step is actually more or less straightforward in MEG. Uh, if we go for a boundary element model, then we just have to define the inner surface of the skull. This is because the magnetic field is sensitive to magnetic permeability. And this per magnetic permeability is not that much affected by the air or the skull. Like the f basically, the magnetic field can cross the skull almost unaffected. This is definitely not the case in EEG, where we need to model really precisely the skull, because what affects the propagation of the currents is the conductivity. And the conductivity of the skull is much, much lower than the conductivity of the brain. So it's this being said, uh, once this uh, lead field or forward solution is uh, accurately computed, we can try to inverse uh, the relationship, try to isolate the current. But this <coughs> cannot be uh, done with perfect accuracy because we have a nil post problem. But anyway, there are some solutions in the literature that exist, such as the, the beamformer approach. There exist also some other solution, but I will not. That's not the purpose of this talk. Uh, just what you should have clear now is that uh, we can have access to the brain activity at different uh, points in the brain and then from that perform uh, correlation, coherence or entropy based uh, method to assess the connectivity between uh, those sources. There are however some, uh, some pitfalls with reconstructing sources one should be aware about and they all pertain to the properties of the, of the lead field. Let's see. The first one uh, comes from the fact that the lead field, the amplitude of the lead field or the power of the lead field decreases drastically as we approach the center of the brain. So as you can see there, the lead field is about, so here if you check the color scale, 0.1 at the level of the cortex and about uh, two orders of magnitude lower in the center of the brain. So it means that we we record with much lower uh, accuracy or, with, or, the sign or the brain activity inside the brain generates much lower uh, magnetic fields. Uh, so this leads to uh, the fact that we cannot really uh, know what's happening inside the brain or in those deep nuclei. Uh, the second uh, pitfall comes uh, is named the spatial leakage or volume conduction and this pertains to the fact that uh, the lead field of neighboring sources is highly correlated. So as you can see there, I've taken a seed there and correlated just the lead field between the seed and whichever point of the brain. So if you, if you check something that is about blue or green, between blue and green, the correlation between the activity from uh, this source and this one will be about 0.5 just because of the spatial uh, leakage. Uh, so when we speak about spatial leakage and volume conduction, this is actually a correlation between the reconstruct sources. This is not exactly that, but it, it depends on the, the inverse solution. So that's why I just put it this correlation for the lead field. So when we speak about functional connectivity, uh, there is we have to know that there is not only one type of functional connectivity. The signals are complex signals and they can interact between each other in uh, different ways. One way to interact is the face-to-face -face coupling. It's maybe the most intuitive uh, type of coupling, whereby two signals of the same frequency content have their uh, oscillations linked to each other. So the phase, if we analyze signal Y with respect to the maximum of signal X, then you can see that signal Y is always on a falling edge there and there, falling edge, falling edge, falling edge. Uh, to quantify this, one can use the coherence, which is a simple extension of the correlation to the frequency domain. So basically coherence is one when the signals, when the Fourier coefficient of bo both signals are uh, exactly proportional and is zero when there is no linear relationships between those. And then there is another uh, index of interest, which is also often used in the literature, which is a nonlinear index because it's, uh, it, it just quantifies how the phases of uh, the signals are linked to each other and uh, doesn't quantify, doesn't take into account the variations of amplitude. 
but I would I would claim that uh, in general those two parameters are quite close to each other. Even this one includes uh, includes the amplitude in its computation. Uh, this type of coupling is actually quite important, and it has been hypothesized to to be a, a sort of mechanism by which distant brain areas could communicate. This is the uh, communication through coherence hypothesis put forward by Pascal Fries. So according to this hypothesis, distant brain areas uh, that tries to communicate will uh, oscillate uh, in coherence or will synchronize their oscillations between because those oscillations define some periods of excitability during which a coherent a uh, group of neurons can exchange information. Whereas neurons that are not coherent or not synchronized with each other will fail to ex exchange information because the output of one cell uh, will just reach another cell during a low, n during a period in which the cell is not excitable, excite cannot be excited. Another type of coupling is uh, the amplitude to amplitude coupling whereby two oscillations, uh, not necessarily of the same frequency content, will interact not through phase coupling, so the, the phases of those two oscillations are not linked, but by envelope coupling. So the modulation of those, uh, of those carrier, of those waves, uh, that can be extracted with Hilbert transform, uh, are linked to each other. And then to quantify how coupled they are, one can use this favorite uh, connectivity parameters such as coherence, correlation, phase locking, entropy, bismuth, or so, or whatever. Uh, this coupling has been uh, implicated in the discovery of the resting state networks with MEG. So that was actually very important uh, finding in the world of uh, MEG. And this, is, uh, this has been published in this seminal paper by HIP and collaborators. So they took a seed in uh, a sensory cortex, in primary cortex, and then extracted the invert an Hilbert envelope of uh, the seed in the alpha or, or beta frequency band and performed envelope correlation with the rest of uh, the brain. And what they found, so here you can see uh, this, the result of, of this analysis when performed with the seed in the primary sensory motor cortex. So obviously this, this first map, we only see the spatial leakage, the fact that uh, reconstructed sources are intrinsically coherent because they combine similar signals. Uh, but the, the smart thing they did was to actually orthogonalize the, sent the, the activity from different brain areas with respect to the seed. And doing so, here you can see the, the map computed with this orthogonalization procedure. So clearly this uh, spatial leakage was reduced quite a bit. And then by changing simply the color scale, so they still found some sort of, uh, of spatial leakage, reduced one, and then some, uh, some correlation in the other hemisphere. So this kind of shows that at rest, left and right primary sensory motor cortex are uh, dynamically coupled through envelope correlation. They did also for the, somato for the auditory and visual, uh, visu visual cortices, and those, those two also were linked. You can always see uh, a local maximum in the control lateral hemisphere. And they also uh, characterized which uh, carrier frequency is important for this uh, frequency, uh, for this envelope correlation. Uh, and you can see here the correlation coefficient as function of uh, the carrier frequency. So you can see that it peaks between 8 and 32 hertz, so corresponding to the alpha and uh, beta rhythm. And they also show that the feature of interest, the feature that correlates between this, the, this, the two sensory cortices, are the, the temporal fluctuations of the envelope on at very slow uh, rates. So here you see so it's a quite complex plot. It's a correlation plotted as function of the carrier frequency. So here you can see that it peaks in the alpha beta band. And they also bandpass filtered the envelope before uh, performing correlation. So this actually shows that 
its feature slower than, let's say, 0 0.1, uh, sec uh, 0 0.1 hertz that drive this correlation. So this was actually very interesting finding because this is exactly what is uh, shown in fMRI, that the slow fluctuations of the bold signals are correlated across uh, different resting state uh, networks. So this is better illustrated by the study by Brooks and collaborators. So you can see here on the top, fMRI uh, resting state networks and MEG resting state networks identified with ICA-based method, but still, um, it still pertains to envelope correlation. And they actually also found the DMN uh, default mode network, which is the, the way I understand it, the, uh, the set of brain areas activated when we don't do anything. And finally, a third type of uh, coupling is the phase amplitude coupling. Uh, it is kind of a mix of the two uh, first coupling I've been uh, presenting. In this coupling, a signal of low frequency content modulates the signal of the envelope of a signal of higher frequency content. So there's no relationship between the frequency of those two. There's just a relationship between this signal and the envelope of the other signal. And once again, to quantify the coupling between the two, one can use his preferred uh, coupling index. And in this matter, actually, the, uh, the coupling index that has been uh, used first by Canolti and collaborators is uh, the uh, modulation index, which is uh, more or less related to some uh, entropy-based uh, measure. So let's go back to this Canolti and collaborators study. So in their paper, from 2006, it's an ECOG paper actually, it's, a, it's a not, uh, not MEG. They recorded uh, brain activity uh, from, uh, like from epileptic patients in a wide variety of tasks, and such as like auditory, memory, motor tasks, they, they were really a lot of tasks, I mean, it was sorry. about... Could you speak a little bit up, it's hard to hear. Ah, sorry, so yes, I will try maybe to <laughs> do it. Yes, sorry. <coughs> yes, so there, there were about 20 different tasks that they uh, asked the subjects to perform. And then they noted that uh, a large majority of the electrodes displayed some uh, theta to gamma phase amplitude coupling. So this is represented there, where you can see the timing and a time frequency analysis so that, that's a coupling bit, uh, within the same electrode. So the theta of one electrode couples with the gamma within the same electrode, just to make it clear. And when analyzing, uh, performing a time frequency analysis on, uh, on brain activity with respect to a trough of uh, the theta cycle, then you, they could clearly uh, show that activity in the gamma band was uh, modulated in gamma band and high gamma band. And then again, making some sort of very complex plot of the modulation index as function of the frequency for phase and the frequency for amplitude. They demonstrated that what drives this uh, correlation or coupling is the, the six hertz slow theta rhythm and uh, gamma band above 75 hertz. So what could be the functional role for this coupling? There are uh, essentially two hypotheses. One is that uh, it would mediate uh, network synchronization. So because gamma, gamma <coughs> oscillations are very fast oscillations, they, are, they cannot really synchronize uh, at long range. So they will synchronize uh, neuronal groups at very short distances and those, and the synchronization between those distant brain areas at long distance will be performed by uh, the, the theta activity because it's much less sensitive to, uh, to uh, <coughs> propagation delays. Another hypothesis uh, is that this theta to gamma coupling reflects the working memory. Basically, according to this hypothesis, every theta cycle would represent a reactivation of the working memory. And within those cycles, every 
small uh, gamma oscillation would encode a given feature of uh, our working memory. So I guess I'm done for the different types of coupling. And uh, now for the remainder of this talk, I would like to argue that functional connectivity, uh, the strict definition of functional connectivity actually can be also applied to uh, brain activity and uh, the stimuli we see or we hear and uh, the action we make because it's still connectivity between brain activity and peripheral uh, signals. And to study this kind of uh, coupling, I've mainly been using uh, coherence analysis. So analyzing the brain signals with a reference signal. So in the remainder of this presentation, that will be the kinematics of, of a finger when performing some repetitive hand movements. Uh, within the framework of coherence analysis, one can have access to the cross correlogram or cross spectrum. And this is actually a very nice thing because this has, it has the spatial distribution of a magnetic field. So we can perform co correlation uh, or coherence analysis and have a special have a, have a parameter, let's say, the cross correlogram that has the spatial distribution of magnetic field and then perform dipole modeling on this topography and identify the source responsible for the encoding or perception or whatever of the signal of reference. And then what can be used as well is the coherence directly in the source space to perform group analysis. So having some uh, coherence maps for all the subjects and then uh, normalizing those maps to a template and averaging uh, the, whole, the whole thing. So just to summarize the key points from uh, this first part is that MEG provides time sensitive information one can use to study the functional connectivity through different type of uh, coupling. But there are some limitations. I just made two slides about it, but I think it's, uh, it's very important to emphasize that uh, there is an heterogeneous uh, signal-to-noise ratio across the brain, in the sense that we do not record that well the deep sources. And uh, there is the problem of volume conduction. So when interpreting the results, one has always to be quite careful about that and take this into account. So I will now move to this second part, and I will be speaking about corticokinematic coherence and uh, the clinical applicability. So by corticokinematic coherence, we mean the coherence between brain activity and uh, the kinematics of uh, hand movement, for example, when performing repetitive movements or task-related uh, movements. So let me just give uh, you uh, a brief introduction, or I'm sure you all know that, but about the motor system, sensory motor system. So to control movement, just really uh, briefly, uh, the primary motor cortex, premotor cortex, supplementary motor area, send their axon down the corticospinal tract to contact muscle fibers and actually perform the movements. The proprioception and the tactile input generated by these movements are then monitored uh, at the periphery and the information is sent back to the cortex through the dorsal column medial, medial lemniscal pathway. And uh, to state the very obvious, those two cortices are somatotopically organized. So with the hand uh, located about uh, in the middle, the foot in the interior of the interhemispheric seizure, and uh, the face area located on, uh, on the more lateral part of it. So what, what, uh, what single cell recordings teach us from, uh, from single cell recordings from the monkey motor cortex teach us is that the activity from motor cortical areas is modulated by uh, different, uh, different parameters of the kinematics such as uh, direction, amplitude, speed, acceleration, and, and so on. So uh, this has been demonstrated in the, in the monkey. And to try to extend this to the human, uh, Jerby and collaborators in a quite interesting paper in PNAS, uh, tried to, to have the same kind of task. So manipulating in this task, it was manipulating a trackball with the hand, measuring the velocity. 
And what they were doing, actually, the task was to compensate in predictable rotations from a cube displayed in front of them. And doing so, they, they were making some, uh, some let's say, not, not random, but some movements on this trackball. And then he assessed the coupling between uh, hand kinematics and brain signals and identified the primary motor cortex as the main coherent brain area. And the coherence mainly developed at the frequencies corresponding to hand movement frequencies. So you can see here the power spectrum of the, uh, of the trackball speed and here the coherence spectrum. And you can notice like the core occurrence of those two peaks. Uh, and to go further, so uh, first they identify this coupling between hand kinematics and brain activity in the primary motor cortex. Uh, they perform a coherence analysis between the activity in the primary motor cortex and the rest of the brain and compared it uh, with this coherence in rest conditions. And what they identified is a large sensory motor network comprising primary premotor, supplementary motor area, posterior parietal cortex, and even cerebellum. And they also attempted to, uh, to uncover the uh, theta to gamma phase amplitude coupling, but were not su successful uh, in that they only ad identified visual areas. Though the power of the gamma amplitude was higher uh, in the movement condition than in the rest condition over those, this motor cortex. So from a Jerby study, we learned that kinematics of, uh, the kinematics of the hand and brain signals are coupled, but it was actually uh, taken for granted that this reflects the motor command sent to the periphery based on the, the previous studies. So one of our aim was to, to reanalyze this first in a bit a more uh, simple task in which we had just repetitive hand movements without visual feedback and uh, try to see if we can tell something about the direction because this is very important of the coupling between brain and the periphery. So in the first study, we first tried to kind of replicate Jerby's, Jerby's finding in a more natural context. So using simple repetitive movement, measuring the kinematics of uh, the hand movement with an accelerometer attached to the index finger. And we have two conditions, finger not touching each other and touching each other. Uh, the movement were performed at about three or four hertz, depending on the subject. And we performed this coherence analysis. Here you can see the power spectrum of the acceleration and here the coherence spectrum. And a co-occurrence between the peaks in the acceleration and the coherence. So sort of rec replicating uh, Jerby's result and demonstrating that the coherence occurs at movement frequency. And performing some source analysis, we found that uh, as Jerby did, a large sensory motor network is recruited during this task, comprising uh, motor cortices, even primary sensory cortex as well, uh, posterior parietal cortex, also some contralateral brain areas. <coughs> but as I just uh, said to motivate the study, this coupling might actually, because we are not interested, we, we do not investigate uh, the direction of the coupling with coherence analysis itself. So this might reflect motor commands sent by the motor cortex to the periphery, proprioceptive feedback coming back to the cortex or tactile input. So to try to dis disentangle between those possibilities, we asked subjects to do this, this. This time we used the simple finger tapping. To do this repetitive finger tapping in an active way. And then we did it also in a passive way, having an experimenter, me actually, moving the finger of those 15 guys <laughs> at more or less the same uh, frequency. Uh, and the rationale for this is that during passive movements, there is no or at least the contribution is negligible, the contribution of the uh, efferent uh, signals. Why the proprioceptive feedback is preserved in both conditions. We had also two conditions, one in which the finger was touching the table and one in which it was not touching the table, so that we could also assess the effect of uh, tactile uh, input. Uh, just I uh, 
would like to make this point that, of course, e even, even if uh, corticokinematic coherence would reflect proprioception, it's still difficult to say whether uh, the area we identified is the primary uh, sensory cortex or, or motor cortex because uh, the primary motor cortex receives some information from S1 and S2 about proprioception and receives also some uh, direct uh, proprioceptive feedback actually. So first of all, uh, we assessed, we made sure that there was no muscle activity during our passive condition, at least not more than, uh, than what's happening during uh, resting condition. So this was negative, good for us. And uh, we then performed coherence analysis at the source space, trying to identify some difference in the localization of uh, those uh, sources. And we didn't manage actually to show any difference in all the corticokinematic coherence conditions. But we could show that somatosensory evoked fields were located at a slightly different location than the uh, corticokinematic coherence sources. And then when performing an ANOVA to compare the results, uh, to compare the amplitude of coherence across the conditions, we could not demonstrate any effect of tactile afferents, kind of suggesting that corticokinematic coherence is not mainly driven by the tactile input. And uh, we found a similar or even increased coherence during the passive condition. So this was a clear sign that the corticokinematic coherence is mainly driven by proprioceptive feedback to the SM1 cortex. And uh, finally, all this is very nice, but still we haven't been using any directionality parameters. This is still uh, only sticking with coherence and making some, uh, some indirect, and by some indirect arguments proving our purpose. But to go further, then we use some, uh, some directionality uh, index, but first we computed coherence then as, as done before at the sensor space and for every subject extracted the sensor displaying the maximum uh, coherence. So this is just coherence analysis. Oh, by the way, the frequency, uh, the frequency axis is normalized by movement frequency. So it's expressed in F0 units, movement frequency units. So one is movement frequency, two second, first harmonic, and three second harmonic, and so on. So we extracted this sensor showing the maximum coherence and then went on to perform uh, renormalized partial directed coherence uh, between brain activity from the sensor and the kinematics. And what we, we showed was that uh, in the afferent direction, the coherence, the partial directed coherence peaked at moving frequency and second harmonic, whereas th this really happened seldom, seldomly. Uh, in the efferent direction. And performing an ANOVA, of course, showed that coherence was uh, way higher in the afferent direction, thereby reinforcing our finding. So now I'm done about discussing about the uh, basic phys neurophysiology of corticokinematic coherence. So I will move on to uh, clinical application. And the first obvious clinical application is the mapping of the primary sensory motor uh, cortex. So this is actually not very useful in healthy subjects because uh, we know from the basic neuroanatomy that the primary sensory motor cortex is located at the hand knob of the central sulcus, in the precentral uh, gyrus. This is in mainly quite easy to identify in healthy subjects, but in the case of patients, when you have some uh, some space occupying lesion distorting the local neuroanatomy, then it becomes much more challenging and it's actually very wishable to have some, uh, some dots coming there and telling you the motor cortex is there and please don't remove this part of the cortex because then the patient will uh, end up paralyzed. So the first thing to demonstrate was that corticokinematic coherence uh, can be can localize the primary sensory motor cortex at the level of the individual subject. So from our 10 subjects, we, we performed some uh, simple 
coherence analysis and extracted the cross coilogram, as I mentioned at the beginning, and performed uh, equivalent current dipole modeling of this cross coilogram. And could, in all of them, identify the primary sensory motor cortex. Well, at least it co localized with the anatomically defined uh, motor cortex. So this kind of shows that CKC, or cortical kinetic coherence, uh, appears to be a promising and sensitive method to map this primary sensory motor cortex. Then it might be also that some centers do not especially have access to uh, accelerometer because well, it's a bit technical to build it. So we try to generalize this cortical kinematic coherence to other kind of, uh, of kinematic parameters. So we recorded the same cortical kinematic coherence of type, type of movement, repetitive movement, with accelerometer, a pressure ball, and a force transducer. And we also recorded the activity from, uh, <coughs> from the uh, muscles with electromyography, from extensors and flexor muscles. And we showed that in all the cases, we found some uh, robust coherence and were able in uh, all our subjects to localize the primary sensory motor cortex without difference in localization uh, between the, the different <coughs> peripheral signals. So if you want to do these kind of experiments at your site, then you can, you can simply record the EMG if it's easier for you and perform the coherence with the envelope of the EMG signal. And finally, this is something you don't want to see when you perform an MEG experiment, the patient coming back for an evaluation. But uh, in the meanwhile, he got some resection. He got operated and got now those uh, cranial fix in his head. Or somebody coming with tooth braces. You want to see somebody normal, just Mr. Everyone coming without generating any artifacts. So that's what we did, actually. Uh, we uh, attach some uh, piece of metal, a cranial fix, to the head of uh, our subjects above the uh, presupposed location of the primary sensory motor cortex and then attached a piece of uh, tooth brace in our mouth <laughs> and uh, performed this condition as uh, Mr. Everyone without any metal artifact. Basically, this is a sample of the signal, raw signal, uh, when we perform the repetitive movement with this attached to our head. So this is pretty nasty because this is located just at the location of, uh, of the activity we expect. And uh, so at first glance, we, we were thinking that this is never going to work. We won't be able to localize the uh, SM1 cortex from those uh, very noisy data. But, but, <laughs> but, uh, with the Neuromac, so Neuromac device comes this uh, max filter software that allows to, uh, to filter, spatially filter the signal so as to separate the uh, magnetic field measured by the sensor into an inner, outer component and noise. So this is based on the uh, signal space separation algorithm because of the different properties of the magnetic field coming from inside the sphere and outside the sphere. And there is also an extension of this uh, method called spatiotemporal SSS, which allows to reject those components from the magnetic field coming from inside that are too much correlated from uh, the activity coming from outside. And this is actually used in the cases where uh, patients produce two huge artifacts, for example, when they, they have some breathe uh, implants inside the body and they when they breathe they will produce some huge artifacts. This can be removed quite well with max filter. Still our problem is that our signal in of interest in the primary sensory motor cortex co-localizes quite well with uh, the artifacts. So our first guess was that max filter would completely wipe away this signal and not allow us to, to model any source in the primary sensory motor cortex. So here is an example of, uh, of one subject, uh, Daniel, who uh, performed this task. And here you can see in green the power spectrum with the uh, cranial fix attached to his head. And you can see that the power is four orders of magnitudes higher in this uh, head condition than in the other conditions. We anyway asked to Max Filter to remove those artifacts. 
using uh, the temporal uh, temporal extension with 0.9 of uh, uh, threshold for rejection and 20 seconds of buffer length. And what we found was that the level of uh, the spectrum was set even lower than uh, the one with teeth and no, no artifacts. This was actually sort of expected and this could actually this actually reflects the fact that Max Filter removed something out of interest because he removed the artifact but he did more than that. He also removed a bit of signal. But anyway, uh, when checking the uh, pattern, the topograph, the, the topoplots of the uh, coherence, we could clearly see that uh, the pattern was similar with slightly lower coherence in the case of Daniel, but this, this was actually not the case in the other subjects. I still need to have a, uh, a look into that. To, so I cannot, I cannot say right now whether it really affected the level of coherence or not. Uh, but the point is that we still manage uh, to, to fit a dipole there right in the primary sensory motor cortex even with this huge artifact. So if Max Filter removed something, it did not remove everything. And the last point I would like to consider for clinical application is that yes, now we have cortical kinematic coherence, but there exist a lot of different <coughs> functional indicators of the SM1 cortex. So, in a con so for our full clinical uh, assessment of uh, patients, one can also include the cortico, uh, corticomuscular coherence, which is the coupling between brain activity and muscle activity during isometric contraction. And this is actually a landmark of the primary sensory motor cortex. It's actually debated whether it's, a, it's purely motor or sensory motor. And then another landmark, landmark of the primary sensory motor cortex is the mu rhythm that is blocked during movement preparation and execution. And uh, it's also possible to locate the central sulcus with uh, median nerve stimulation. So we included all those techniques as well as fMRI to have a comprehensive mapping of the sensory motor function of 10 subjects and 4 patients with space occupying lesion. So all in all we had several uh, functional indicators, CKC with and without touch, neurhythm blocking at 1020 hertz, uh, we had cortex muscle coherence, somatosensory evoked fields and fMRI in a simple block design task. And so that was seven dots on our MRI, and we modeled those, uh, the distribution of those dots with a principal component analysis and tried to uh, model the spread with uh, an ellipsoid uh, computed from the singular value decomposition of uh, the coordinates of those functional indicators. So basically what we could report was the length of the major axis characterizes the direction of maximal spread of the dipoles and uh, the volume of this ellipsoid. So here you can see that dipoles spread more, volume is bigger, major axis is bigger. So here are the results for our 10 subjects and four patients, and just a one patient single out there. So in all our uh, participants, we could identify uh, the primary sensory motor, well, sorry, uh, five from seven uh, functional indicators uh, displayed some uh, goodness of fit that was high enough or some quality parameter that was high enough to be included in the mapping. And uh, the center of the ellipsoid fitted from those uh, dipoles or functional localizers co-localized quite well with the primary sensory motor cortex always overlapping with it. And finally, uh, the spread of the dipoles was actually uh, higher so this did not reach significance because we have quite we had quite low amount of patients. But 80% uh, of the dipoles were less than 10 millimeters apart from the center of the ellipsoid in subjects, and only 50% of those in the patient, kind of suggesting a spread of the mo motor function in those patients. And so, just from a qualitative point of view, it was actually nice to have all those dipoles just putting the same area. This actually increases quite a bit the confidence we have in our mapping. So just to uh, conclude and, and give a take-home message from this second part of the talk, cortical kinematic coherence uh, reflects the proprioceptive feedback from the periphery to the primary sensory motor cortex. It can be used to map the primary sensory motor cortex 
as well as using simple acceleration or different whatever parameter you like as far as it's related to the kinematics of the movement. Uh, we can include some patients generating artifacts by using a max filter with temporal signal space separation. And I would say that a multimodal approach is anyway highly recommendable in the context of uh, the evaluation uh, for a pre-surgical mapping. How much time do I have? Is it still? Um, we started late, but even according to schedule, you have about 10. 10? 10, but we can, okay. we can go with over because we were late. E so what is? Uh, about 20, 20 minutes to finish minutes, this. Perfect. Okay. Right. So now I will go for this uh, third part of, uh, of this talk, dealing with movement observation. So we've been uh, studying what, what happens when we do this ourselves, and now we will go to what happens when we observe somebody doing the same kind of, uh, of movement. First of all, why is it of any interest? Why do we want to probe action observation? And the answer to this, uh, that would be better explained by Eric Tari, because it's a, a topic of interest, is because a la large part of our, our social interactions are based on nonverbal interactions. We observe the gestures, the postures, and the gaze of people to try to infer their, uh, their goals or their intent. And uh, from this, a major question arises is, how do we understand the goal of other people? So this is actually quite a tough question to, to answer with our techniques. And an easier question people have been addressing is, how similar is brain activity during action execution and action observation? So the first study that should ring the bell is uh, the one by Di Pellegrino and Rizzolatti. This is a famous uh, study uh, relating the discovery of the mirror neurons that are neurons activated both when observing an action and performing the same action. So in this case, that was a monkey picking up a peanut and taking it to the mouth or an, an experimenter picking up this peanut. So the same neuron in the premotor cortex of, uh, of this little monkey were activated in both uh, conditions. And later on it was also demonstrated that uh, the inferior parietal lobule is also activated both during action execution and observation. So those two uh, brain areas are considered to be the core of the mirror neuron system. So it's actually of interest to investigate this in humans and to do so uh, Rittari uh, in collaboration with Rizzolatti studied the uh, rebound of the muridum during movement uh, observation. So what's happening during uh, movement execution is that there was actually no rebound of the muridum. This is following the median of stimulation. So in rest condition, there is a rebound of the muridum. And when you perform yourself a movement while your, your median nerve is stimulated, then there is no rebound of this, uh, of this muridum, kind of showing that the motor when the motor cortex is activated, this rebound is completely abolished. And what's happen what happens actually during uh, movement observation is intermediate. There is a rebound of the mu rhythm, but this one is partially blocked, kind of suggesting that the M1 cortex is activated during movement observation in humans. Uh, later on, they also uh, kind of replicated this finding in a more natural setting. So using this time tapping on a drum or observing somebody tapping on a drum, and they showed that the mu rhythm was also modulated to a lower extent in uh, the observation condition. It has also been demonstrated that there exists a, a kind of a correlate of this uh, Bereits calf potential, that is the low uh, fluctuation, low modulation of the, the M1 activity uh, before movement when one is to make finger tapping and can choose himself about the timing of this tapping. But to do this kind of experiment, you need to have very long uh, inter-tapping intervals. But anyhow, this was, uh, this potential can be recorded in the context of movement observation. But of course, the timing of the movement should be highly predictable by the subject to see it. Otherwise, it, it would never appear before the movement actually happens. And this was actually 
uh, this actually developed in the M1 cortex without any muscle activity. To go further with our question, how similar is uh, brain activity during action observation and observation? We tried to see whether corticokinematic coherence can be seen in the context of movement observation because this CKC is a feature of the, of the sensory motor uh, system. So the task was simple, a subject sitting in the MEG and an experimenter placing his hand in front of him and making those uh, very boring movements. And we uh, recorded the acceleration for Miss Index Finger and performed uh, coherence analysis between hand kinematics and the brain activity of the observer. What we found is that the coherence peaked mainly in posterior sensors as was expected because this is also a visual task and of course the uh, visual cortices will be activated rhythmically. But we also found some local maxima of uh, coherence, so this is not entirely clear on the basis of those uh, topographies. But then we went on, we uh, performed some source reconstruction and uh, could see that the visual areas were activated as well as the left and right cerebellum. It is actually not that clear whether this reflects spatial leakage, but there were some clear local maxima in the cerebellum, so this we reported anyway. And uh, the coherence also peaked in the primary uh, motor cortex uh, bilaterally with a lower level of, uh, uh, of coherence. So this kind of demonstrates the time-sensitive involvement of the M1 cortex and cerebellum in the kinematic representation of observed goal, uh, non-goal directed uh, movements. And this is in line with previous studies demonstrating that the M1 cortex neurons, so th I think that's uh, studies in humans, and uh, they, they showed that during action observation and action of execution, some neurons actually uh, discharge similarly. Okay. See you. Uh, nevertheless, we cannot completely exclude that the activation of this primary sensory motor cortex is, doesn't reflect the modulation of, of its activity by the premotor cortex because M1 cortex is downstream from premotor cortex. What what, however, is against this, uh, this hypothesis is that we didn't see any coherence at the level of the premotor cortex. And the, act the activation in the cerebellum is uh, first in line, of course, cerebellum is, uh, is it plays a very important role for uh, movement execution. So it has the role of correcting the motor errors. And in the context of movement observation, it has been suggested to be also part of the action observation network and it has uh, an important role in uh, the observation of body postures. One thing we uh, can be completely sure about is that the activation of the cerebellum could also reflect some uh, mere perception of uh, motion and we don't have actually any uh, control condition to, to reject this possibility. And finally, the activation of those three brain areas is in line with the existence of cortical cerebral cortical loops for the visual guidance of movement. So the activity from visual areas, the visual areas send some information to the cerebellum uh, through the pon pontine nuclease. And then the cerebellum, of course, communicates with the M1 cortex through the thalamus. And uh, the visual cortex sends some information to the primary uh, sensory motor cortex through the dorsal visual stream. So overall, this kind of suggests that there is an increased connectivity in uh, the whole uh, visual motor uh, system. This is actually reinforced by our finding of higher coherence between all those brain areas. So this is not corrected for multiple comparisons, but there were many more links than expected by uh, pure uh, random connectivity measures and this is uh, coherence the coherence is contrasted the, the statistics are performed against the resting condition so uh, what is demonstrated is that the M1 and cerebellum are activated during observation of non-goal directed movement but one point that is clear in the theory of mirror neurons is that 
the cortical areas are supposed to be recruited uh, more extensively during observation of goal-directed uh, movement. So we further adapted our task of repetitive movement to a uh, goal-directed setting. So in this, in this case, we ask the subject to pick up a green foam made piece from the heap and place it in the pot and do this over and over again. And doing this, he did perform some about one hertz uh, movement. And we did it in an executed condition, subject doing it itself, and observed condition this time, so that we could see which brain area are activated both during action execution and observation. So the movement frequency was uh, higher during observed condition than during executed condition. And this was 0.8 hertz and 1 hertz, so not that, that big difference, I would say. And we could confirm that there were no uh, movement during uh, the observation condition by performing coherence between muscle activity and the kinematics of the movement. So this was not higher than uh, during resting condition. Performing some uh, source uh, level reconstruction, then here it's, uh, you can see in the executed condition, observed condition, movement frequency first harmonic. What was actually common between those two conditions was the activation of the primary sensory motor cortex bilaterally and of the uh, superior parietal lobule and uh, posterior part of the superior temporal gyrus, which is also uh, known to play a role in the uh, observation of actions. And uh, just to, to mention it briefly, <coughs> uh, we had also some uh, we also made the analysis of coherence between the beta envelope and the kinematics of hand movements. So this has actually been done before. And it shows basically that the mu rhythm is dynamically modulated by the movement, be it executed or observed. So our finding shows that the M1 cortex, superior parietal lobule and superior temporal gyrus, uh, the kinematics of those brain these brain areas are involved in the representation of the kinematics of non goal of goal directed actions one point is that it could actually reflect something else than uh, activation it could actually be also inhibition and that with MEG we cannot really disentangle it could clearly be that uh, those neurons would just receive some inhibitory uh, post-synaptic potentials and then there would be anyway some current flowing through those neurons and this would just reflect some inhibition. So we are not able to, to say anything about that. Another thing I would like to, to point out is that fMRI, fMRI studies, uh, especially performed by Gazzola and collaborators, now demonstrated that during movement observation there are not only motor areas that are recruited but there are also some uh, sensory areas, primary sensory motor cortex, mis mixed areas that are supposed to integrate sensory information and communicate with motor cortex. All those areas are recruited. And so what's the interpretation of this? Because the interpretation of the activation of mirror neurons is that we recruit, we represent the action of others by s simulating their actions. We have a kind of uh, inner understanding of their action by automatically recruiting the same cells by simply observing the movements. In the context of uh, moment observation, the activation of the sensory areas can be interpreted as uh, understanding what's, what it feels like to move like I observe. And this is actually quite in line with the fact that we demonstrate that cortical kinematic coherence is linked to proprioception. So <coughs> a, final, a final study that I would like to present you today is about movement imitation, I inhibition. So basically the M1 cortex is activated when we observe uh, actions, but then how come we don't imitate those actions? There must be some, uh, some inhibition mechanism somewhere. And some lesion, lesion studies actually demonstrated, demonstrate that some patients with uh, left frontal lobe lesions can become what we call ecopractic. So those patients 
will, will not be able to refrain from imitating what they see. This suggests that the M1, the frontal lobe actually exerts some inhibition on uh, motor cortices. This is embedded also in BN's model that is based on f some fMRI data. So in this model, the uh, right medial or inferior frontal gyrus sends some inhibitory information to the premotor cortex, which is involved in automatic imitation. And then the premotor cortex sends information to br other brain areas, such as pre posterior parietal and the operculum. But this model doesn't explain what's happening at the level of the fi final effector, which is the primary motor cortex that is, anyway, activated during movement observation. So to try to, to see what's happening at this level, we had a study in which we monitored cortex muscle coherence, which is thought to directly, which directly reflects the coupling between brain activity and the periphery. So just to, to briefly remind you, uh, cortex muscle coherence is the coupling between brain activity and muscle activity happening around 20 at 20 hertz and that uh, occurs only during isometric contraction. It's abolished during movements. So the setting was as follow. The subject was contracting um, his fingers on a false transducer, kept his contraction as constant as possible while observing a hand placed two meters away, performing some transient contractions every three to uh, six seconds. And then we perform coherence, cortex muscle coherence analysis at the sensor level and extract it from those, this pre-selection of 18 radiometers located above the primary sensory motor cortex. We extracted the sensor displaying the highest coherence level. Five subjects did not display any coherence and nine displayed some uh, nice coherence. So we just kept those uh, nine good subjects and discarded those one. Because if they don't have some uh, baseline coherence, then the, of course they won't be able to modulate anything. And then we went on to perform some, uh, some analysis time locked to the onset of the movements. So the movements you can see for the nine subjects was performed with finished regularity, almost invariable. And performing coherence analysis. So you can see here the time in seconds and the frequency and the value of the coherence. The coherence was increased in the first uh, second window following directly following uh, the execution of the movement. And this was accompanied by a modulation of the mu rhythm. Actually, the frequency, con the frequency was actually a bit different. The maximum frequency here peaks at uh, 18 hertz, and here it peaked at 15 and 7 hertz. This is important for the further interpretation. <coughs> and we also could confirm that the subject did not modulate his force following the uh, movement observation with force signal and also with the EMG signal. There was no significant modulation uh, in the EMG of force. To confirm that cortex muscle coherence did well, or actually that we were really recording something from the primary sensory motor cortex, we performed some source level analysis. So you can see again the time here and coherence at 17, 18 hertz, enhanced following moment observation. And uh, the rhythm at 7 and 15 hertz that peaked in the, this previous slide here. And you can clearly see that this is really coming from the primary sensory uh, motor cortex. This is not a spatial leakage from the visual cortex, which could have been. So to interpret those results, I will just make the parallel with what's happening in the context of uh, moment execution. So this is the study by Kilner and collaborators in which subjects perform isometric contraction and then increase the level of their contraction and then maintain it constant again. Let's just focus on this part of the panel. So the MG power at, uh, beta in the beta band is enhanced during isometric contraction and blocked during moment execution. 
This is exactly actually what, uh, what we observed during movement observation, a blocking of the mu rhythm during movement observation. So this kind of uh, shows that there is a population in the M1 cortex that activates during movement observation. With respect to coherence, coherence is blocked, is, is present during movement, during uh, steady contraction and blocked during movement execution. And this is the opposite of what we observed during uh, movement observation. So this <coughs> shows that there is also maybe another population in the M1 cortex that uh, maintains the coupling between the brain between the SM1 cortex and the periphery so as to promote stabilization of uh, the movement. So last echo message from this uh, last part of this talk is that uh, observers MEG activity follows the kinematics of observed goal and non-goal uh, directed hand movements. The underlying neuronal network extends outside the core mirror neuron systems, recruiting M1 cortex and also maybe uh, sensory uh, cortices in line with the hypothesis of somatosensory mirroring. And finally, during movement observation, different neuronal populations in the M1 cortex are both activi activated and inhibited so as to promote movement stabilization. I would like to uh, conclude by thanking my collaborators from Brain Research Unit, Rita Rive Koyosmaki and two other collaborators who have been uh, collaborating intensively and doing the recordings, Ari Bitulainen and Eros Metz, and people from, uh, from Brussels, and especially Xavier de Thiege, who will give, a, uh, hopefully, a very good talk tomorrow here, and other, uh, all the other collaborators. And thanks to you for your attention.